Good evening. Welcome to tonight's Dazzle Unlimited. I'm Steve Steinberg. I welcome you again to uh, tonight's episode of our ongoing television series. Imagine the possibilities of water on this planet going bad. What would we do? Imagine the possibilities, on the other hand, of paying attention to the issues, the critical issues involved with water. Water supplies, water safety, water sanitation, and all the rest, and the politics and, e and economics of it that affect a world in tremendous ways. Imagine the possibilities of addressing all these things properly and resolving the problem so that we can have a healthier world. These are the focal points altogether in tonight's Dazzle Unlimited show with my very special guest who is sitting here with me. Thank you for being with us. My pleasure. Dr. Rita Caldwell. Now, we are recording tonight's show here in Stockholm, Sweden as, as we speak. Uh, it is uh, early September 2010, just at the moment. Dr. Caldwell has just received the Stockholm Water Prize. And that is a, an award for an outstanding achievement in the whole field of water and what it means to our planet and our lives. Uh, Dr. Caldwell is a former director of the United States National Science Foundation. She, is, uh, she has served as the president of the American Association for the Advancement of Science and the American Society for Microbiology. She's a member of the uh, National Academy of Sciences in the United States, the uh, Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences, and, and many more. And she has so many honorary doctor d degrees, I can't even count them. But, <laughs> so, but one of the, the most critically important areas that you've been personally interested in and involved in and a leader in for many years is the area of microbiology and pollution of the world's waters and what to do about those problems and resolve them. So, do you have a way of putting an overview on the issue of what's involved with water, at least from your perspective of uh, specialization? I feel very strongly that access to safe drinking water is perhaps the single most important issue that faces the world today. I think in the developing countries, unless the young people, children under the age of five, have access to safe drinking water, there will be disease, there'll be economic uh, loss, uh, there'll be social instability, and for countries, even national security will be threatened by the lack of safe drinking water. It, and now, in, I could imagine that most people would think, well, that only happens in the poorer countries. Is that true? Well, I think we had a lesson with Katrina in the United States because um, with the levees breaking and the city being flooded, a first world country that otherwise had access to safe drinking water suddenly didn't. So with extreme weather conditions, with um, the kind of uh, the events we can expect with climate change, this will become a, an issue for all of us to face. Um, and just looking at the United States for the moment, uh, do you have a sense of how cities and states and localities are generally addressing this kind of uh, concern? Are they preparing adequately for it? There's a lot of discussion. Whether there's a lot of action is another question. Probably the most important point to make is that in the United States, in England, in Sweden, at the present time, access to safe drinking water for 99% of the population is assured. Uh, that is, unless there are extreme weather events, breakdown in sewage treatment plants or breakdown flooding, breakdown in uh, the treatment systems. But for the third world countries, every day is a struggle to find safe water. Um, and in fact, every day is a struggle to find water. Women will spend much of the day, women and girls, collecting water for the family for that day. This, this creates a, a serious double problem because it means the little girls don't have time to go to school. So spending time to collect water means that um, they are not then able to be educated. Well, well, and that's another serious problem. Well, where in the less developed world, let's let's narrow it down to some regions. Uh, Africa, gigantic continent, major problems of many kinds. Is, is that one of the most key areas that you would look at in this regard? 
Africa poses a, a, an additional serious problem because of the social instability due to um, the kind of wars that are ongoing, conflicts, um, breakdown. It's Zimbabwe has had a breakdown in their water system that used to be rather good for, for an African country. It was reliable and reasonable, but with corruption, with the fact that the workers who provide the, the water are not paid, nor are the nurses and the doctors, um, leaves the citizens, the average person, completely um, left to his or own, her own uh, uh, measures. And that means going directly to the local streams, the rivers, the ponds, which in turn are places where people bathe, where um, sewage drains in, and the water system then is polluted, and this becomes a really serious health problem. And in other areas of the world, I, I've heard Indonesia has a similar problem, I believe, and uh, maybe you can paint a picture of the rest of the world in, in, along these lines as well. I would say that um, the data for 2007, published by the World Health Organization, shows that just for cholera, and then without including Bangladesh, where cholera is a serious problem, there are probably 100,000 cases around the world uh, with perhaps 5,000 deaths. If you add the data for Bangladesh, it doubles. So this is genuinely a serious human problem and a problem that I think we need to address in a very realistic way. Explore new worlds. Read. Visit literacy.gov and let the journey begin. This is Steve Steinberg speaking. I hope that you're finding value in tonight's episode of Dazzle Unlimited. If you'd like to comment on tonight's topic, or if your company might wish to advertise on the Dazzle Unlimited television series, please let us know. You can email us at dazzle at dazzleunlimited.com. Remember, Dazzle Unlimited airs in southern Manhattan on Time Warner Cable TV Channel 35 every Wednesday evening in prime time at 8.30 p.m. Please make a note of it. And now, back to tonight's episode of Dazzle Unlimited. So this is genuinely a serious human problem and a problem that I think we need to address in a very realistic way. What are the obstacles to, to addressing it in that realistic way that's so necessary? Well, it's interesting that to provide the kind of safe water that we have in Stockholm or in uh, Washington, D.C. or in London, um, it is not feasible in the small villages of Bangladesh or India. And we have to think about the individual um, home, the individual um, capacity to purify the water that's used for drinking. Now this, this was a task that we thought hard about because in the 20 years of research, or actually 30 years now, uh, studying the cause of cholera, we found that the bacterium that is the infectious agent is in natural water systems. So in rivers, bays, estuaries, the bacterium becomes very abundant in the spring and the fall because it's associated with plankton, which are microscopic animals, so to speak, sort of microscopic shrimp, Mm -hmm. uh, in water systems and they're a part of the natural cycle of nature. But if you don't have access to safe drinking water, and it, as occurs in Bangladesh every spring and every fall, there are outbreaks of cholera. The spring is a milder epidemic and the fall is usually a very serious epidemic. 
and this is because there are more bacteria in the water. So we had found this relationship of the bacteria with plankton, and the plankton are fairly large, well, under the microscope. Okay. And so we calculated, we hypothesized that if we could remove the plankton, we would reduce cholera. And we thought, well, removing the plankton would require filtration. So we thought, now, what would be the least expensive filter that every family could afford? And we thought, uh, well, cloth. Cloth? Common cloth? Just common cloth. So we tested the cloth that men wear, their t-shirt material, because everybody, all males in Bangladesh, at least wear t-shirts. They wear t-shirts. Yes. And we tested um, sari cloth, the cloth that women, that lovely, uh, attractive uh, dress that women wear in India, in Bangladesh, is made of a very fine, light cloth that dries very quickly. And there's also a little heavier cloth called Chinese poplin that's available and reasonably inexpensive. So we tested this in the laboratory and we found that seri cloth, when you fold it four or five times, forms a very effective filter that removes plankton and particles. And this is what the bacteria are associated with. What, what was the effect of your findings? We were able to do a three-year study in Bangladesh, in the remote areas, and we included 150,000 people in about um, 50 villages, and we uh, arranged it so that there were control villages that were matched with the villages that we educated the women to filter the water when they collected it and brought it back to the household. And actually, they could see the difference after they had filtered the water. And with a group of women whom we called our extension agents, these were women who we educated, uh, instructed in the process of filtration, why it was important to filter. We gave them charts showing what was in the water before they filtered and how the water would be better after filtration. And they went to the villages every week, they made rounds, and reinforced the um, filtration by gathering the women, speaking to them, and reinforcing the education. So at the end of three years, we found we'd reduced cholera by 50%. So it, it seems to me then that uh, this, Whatever, this is a technology that you've developed, basically. That's right. And based on science, that's really critical. Based on studies we had started back in 1975, 35 years ago. And over the years, we had learned about the relationship with plankton. We had learned about the capacity of the bacterium to go into a dormant stage between epidemics when medical researchers had not been able to isolate it, it wouldn't grow because it's in a dormant state. But when associated with the active growth of plankton, it returns to this active growth phase. You develop the science, you develop the technology based on the science, and then you had to persuade people to actually take action, to do something. So can you describe what you've encountered as to the political issues of this? Actually, the study was a three-year study funded by the National Institutes of Health, the Institute of Nursing. Um, it didn't take much to persuade the women to filter the water. The three-year study was to allow us to get enough data to show that the incidence of cholera was dropping. Because while the women were being educated and were uh, trained to filter the water, over this period of time, we were also monitoring the statistics of the hospital where they would go, uh, their families, their babies, the household members, if they came down with cholera. Mm -hmm. So we were able to actually determine 
the reduction very precisely, statistically significant, and the reduction clearly was 50 percent uh, in cholera. I want to move ahead into a broader picture. This is a good, a good background ex specific example, yes. case example. Um, to other countries of the world that have not just cholera problems, but yes. also other pollutants in their, their waters, yes. uh, whether it's bacteriological or pharmaceutical or whatever. Yeah, can you describe, in any sense, uh, uh, the extent of those kinds of problems and, part two, it's what I was sort of getting at before, the politics of dealing with those issues. Isn't that a major thing, the political side? It's really disturbing that the cost of, of the health problems that come with unsafe water. When you think about the hospital costs um, and some very recent studies we've done showing that when a patient comes in with cholera, that when you examine the clinical sample, um, the stool sample, you find that anywhere from two to seven or eight other pathogens are present. And it means that if you could provide safe water, you're addressing not just cholera, you're addressing eight or nine other diseases at the same time, many of which, parasites for example, we don't have a vaccine. So using vaccines to deal with the problem is not cost effective. And so if countries would understand that safe water would reduce the health care costs would, would, would reduce the morbidity, that is, people being really sick and not able to go to work and just not able to do much. But when you consider, the, the, as the World Health Organization refers to it, the Disability Adjusted Life Years, DALIs, um, the numbers of life years that are lost because people are chronically ill, they, they are not able to function effectively, they can't go to work, they're not able to go to school, it's an enormous cost. So politically, if, if there were a calculation as to the value of providing safe water, and it does not have to be, as in the first world countries, a system that's very high technology, very large reservoirs that are treated, uh, filtered, chlorinated, distributed safely, but providing household units so that each household could take control of its own health and well-being and remove the infectious agents through simple filtration and perhaps even um, little measured quantities of very dilute chlorine so that you could knock out the viruses as well. This would be a remarkable economic social, national security advance. Do, do you find uh, political resistance to that idea in, in even uh, uh, in modern industrialized countries? It's not so much political resistance as lack of understanding of this series of consequences. Lack of understanding of the dramatic overall cost to the country. And then, then what's the basis for that lack of understanding? I think it's easier to raise funds for a standing military army. Uh, it's easier to raise funds for commercial development and for massive construction of um, stadia and all that sort of thing. And it's, it's not so easy to visualize and to enunciate or articulate the value of something is distributed as drinking water for every person. I think it's um, a problem that perhaps we scientists should engage the professional uh, public relations uh, advertising people who can sell beer and whiskey and peanut butter and whatever and do it very effectively. Perhaps we need to engage in understanding motivation, psychology, and develop a massive campaign for safe drinking water. But it's also frustrating that the major funding agencies find it more attractive to, to wage war against disease 
using vaccines. It's a high-tech, sophisticated solution, and it doesn't sound so glamorous to um, treat sewage and to provide safe water. If we could have an X Prize or a Millennium Prize for household, simple, least technical, most effective way of providing safe water, I think that would be the greatest advance to humankind throughout the world. Why don't we focus on safe water for well, everybody? This is Steve Steinberg speaking. I hope that you're finding value in tonight's episode of Dazzle Unlimited. If you'd like to comment on tonight's topic, or if your company might wish to advertise on the Dazzle Unlimited television series, please let us know. You can email us at dazzle at dazzleunlimited.com. Remember, Dazzle Unlimited airs in southern Manhattan on Time Warner Cable TV Channel 35 every Wednesday evening in prime time at 8.30 p.m. Please make a note of it. And now, back to tonight's episode of Dazzle Unlimited. The pharmaceutical pollution of water supplies. It's my understanding that most of what what goes into, even in the United States, into water supplies that come from the, the, the sink or the toilet or whatever, it's loaded with pharmaceuticals, and those things, those pharmaceuticals are not filtered out as the drinking water is then produced for people to drink. Uh, what you, is you, the you, issue here? You, you touch on something very important. I, I would really like to see <clears throat> modern technology applied to um, waste treatment, industrial as well as domestic. We have the technology for carrying out fermentations to do very uh, sophisticated uh, retrieval, if you will, recycling. And in fact, uh, I know that Monsanto has learned that by um, having a pool of the effluent and um, letting it accumulate, they are able to actually retrieve a lot of their product that would otherwise be discharged. And it's profitable because that small amount that goes out into the stream, when it's collected uh, in a holding pond, it can be then extra extracted back, recovered, and sold. And, so, and the water then be pure as a result? Uh, the water would be much clarified. It, it would be to the point of barely detectable. But, but Monsanto, uh, my understanding, they create agricultural-based chemicals and right. fertilizers. Right. It's not pharmaceuticals. Right. So is there a difference here? Um, no, mean, no, no. It can be done as well for pharmaceutical. If a, comp if a company's producing antibiotics or hormones, um, these can, the, the wastes, if they were very intensively re-extracted, they would recover some very valuable material that can be then sold. So, and in sewage treatment plants, rather than just discharging this into the rivers, if we could have a complete recycle, we could extract heavy metals, we could extract the organic materials like the pharmaceuticals, we could do um, a tremendous, we could break down a lot of the uh, cellulosic materials, the food remnants, etc., cetera, and, and that would then provide oxygen and we would be able to uh, enhance the environment with water that's discharged that would be the drinking water level of purity. And that's, that's doable, but it would be, it would involve um, re-engineering the sewage treatment plants of major cities. Which would be a gigantic task. <clears throat> yes and no. Gigantic in the construction, but profitable in the recovery of saleable materials. And recovery, perhaps, of, of uh, let's say, a homogenized and pasteurized fertilizer that could be used uh, rather than chemical fertilizers. 
what would you recommend that the world do, that people do, that governments do to assure that uh, the worlds and the nations and localities drinking water is going to be not only safe but there for people when it's needed? It's important to understand that <clears throat> that high-tech solutions are not universally needed. That for remote villages in areas of Bangladesh or India or Malaysia or parts of the world, Nepal, where it's very difficult to distribute water and use the high technology, if we can focus on empowering individuals, empowering families with units that, that are able to provide them with safe water, and if in the municipalities we could allocate water on an ability to pay basis so that everybody has access to safe water, this would be the single most important action that any country and every country should be taking. It is a universal need. It's a function that we need to provide and we can do it equitably and we can do it and should be doing it. Okay. That, that crystallizes it very well. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Well, again, I thank my very special guest on tonight's Dazzle Unlimited, Dr. Rita Colwell. Thank you. My pleasure. And uh, again, Dr. Colwell is the recipient of the 2010 Stockholm Water Prize, which is an outstanding award for outstanding research into water resources and the need to assure that the world has clean, safe water. You've been watching Dazzle Unlimited. I'll be back next week with another special guest. I hope you join us then. See you. Good night. Oh, and I'm Steve Steinberg. That's me. Good night.